We are on lesson 13, and we will should conclude the third chapter of Joel. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, prophecy in general, and the minor prophets, and where we're headed in Amos. So that's kind of the plan for today. Uh, we're going to do some review. Uh, we are in the book of Joel. We have gone through the first chapter, which talked in depth about the day of the locust. And that led into the second chapter, which was the day of the Lord, as Joel was speaking these revelations to us from God. And then we moved into chapter three, where we saw a significant change in authorship. It uh, is being spoken now to us uh, by Jehovah himself. And he talks about the judgment of nations and then the blessing of God's nation. And as I said, Jehovah is speaking himself in this last chapter. Uh, this is the key themes in Joel chapter 3. We've uh, looked at verses 1 through 6 and saw that the main theme there was about recompense and payback. Uh, the second piece was talking about preparing for war, that this was a time for the nations to be judged and the heathen nations to be judged, those that are round about Israel is how I interpret that scripture, as I shared last week, and we'll review in a moment. And uh, the second piece is judgment and punishment for the heathen nations. And then the last piece is talking about the day of the Lord, and that the Lord is the hope of his people, and that he will cleanse their blood, and uh, the cleansing of Judah and the day of the Lord. So that's kind of the, uh, the way we subdivided the, the passages. Uh, we then have been reading from verses, beginning with verse 1. I'm going to start there and just read through Joel chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 10 with our amplified version. Again, the blue is from the King James. The black is what I've taken from the interlinear Hebrew and amplified the text by that so that we get a little more meaning. And I'm going to just read through it to put us in context for that final chapter and have a few comments as we go. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin. Joel chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather and collect together all Gentile nations, and will bring them down into the deepening valley of Jehoshaphat, where the Lord has judged, and will plead and enter into judgment with them there for my people and for my inheritance, my possession Israel, whom they have scattered and dispersed among the nations, and parted and divided up my land. And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink." Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre, and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine, the Pentopolis? Will ye render me a recompense, the benefit of a deal? And if ye recompense me, swiftly and speedily will I return and send back your recompense and retaliation upon your own head. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things and desirable possessions. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold into the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border and their territory. So up to this verse here, he is kind of reading the accusation against the Gentile nations for what they've done to his people, Israel and Judah and how they have treated, mistreated them. And he's getting very personal about it. He's claiming these things, not, in, uh, not unpersonally, but very personally. I will raise, behold, I will raise out of and awaken out of slumber the place whither ye have sold them, and will retaliate and return your recompense upon your own head. Now, I mentioned last week a couple of words here. The, ter the, the, the term return your recompense is the term retaliate. And when we see the word retaliate, what does that word bring to your mind? What does that, what does that word mean, retaliate?
Eye for an eye. An eye for an eye. It means to make even. Okay? To administer justice. An eye for an eye. Good. And he's going to recompense upon their head. And it's interesting, you know, we have an expression in modern English where I'm going to bring it down upon your head. And that usually means I'm going to bring the punishment to you. But in this particular case, the word head here is the word for chief. So this is also talking about the fact that God is going to exercise his judgment and his retaliation against the leadership of the country, not simply the people. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, the southern kingdom, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken it. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles and heathen nations. Prepare and consecrate yourselves for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near, and let them come up. Beat and hammer your iron plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks and spears and lances. Let the weak say, I am strong. So that is the passage that we've been dealing with. And we then went to 11 and 12 and focused there at the end of the lesson. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen nations. See, up to this point, he's been talking to Israel and Judah. Now he's talking to the heathen nations. Gather yourselves together round about and encircle. Thither cause thy mighty ones, the best warriors, champions to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and brought to readiness and come up to the deepening valley of Jehoshaphat. The Lord has judged, for there will I sit to judge and exercise authority over all the heathen round about surrounding. So a couple of key words here I pointed out last time. Number one was the expression in verse 11 that says, to gather yourselves together round about and encircle. And the question I asked you was, what are they encircling? And in verse 12, again, at the end, it says, he will exercise authority over all the heathen round about or surrounding. And I said, the interpretation here that I'm taking is this is talking about the heathen nations surrounding and round about Israel. And we looked at that in detail last week. We'll review that in a moment. But the other thing I want to, I want to point out to you is a subtle thing here on verse 12. It says, you will come up to the deepening valley of Jehoshaphat. Usually when you approach a valley, what do you do? You go down. But here, what are you doing? You're coming up. And the reason why you're coming up is because this valley of Jehoshaphat is a future valley that will be created when the Mount of Olives is split. And you go up to the Mount of Olives where this valley is split when Jesus has come during the day of the Lord. And he stands there and the Mount of Olives is split open and is a deepening valley as this warfare is being set up and continuing. So we have to be careful with the words here. They give us information if we're, if we're astute enough to catch them and to see them. So we talked about Israel here in the blue star of David in the center of this map. And we're looking at these words in circle, roundabout, and surrounding. And we see this group of nations that are around Israel. And they're, uh, I believe they're the nations referred to in the Nebuchadnezzar dream from Daniel 2, down at the bottom where it says feet and toes of clay, those are kingdoms that arose after the fall of the Roman Empire, the legs of iron. And many people believe that's the European Union. I propose to you that it is, in fact, the League of Arab Nations. And it's these nations that are round about Israel, and they're named in Scripture as these nations. The area near Moscow, West former Soviet Union or Ukraine, East former U Soviet Union or Kazakhstan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Turkey, and Armenia. These are those countries that are surrounding or encircling the nation of Israel. And I believe this reference in Joel is to that latter day encircling toward the end times or toward the, the latter days. So we looked at that last week and I presented this to you then and we're just reviewing it now. Okay, any questions about that material?
and any other ideas or thoughts that anyone would like to share before we move on to today's lesson. I, I missed uh, the Tenth Nation, which was on the list. Turkey and then Armenia. Armenia. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. This this is probably in your notes three or it four is, times, but, Yeah. But that, I like, that's fine. I like it three or four times. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And then I showed to you the silliness of considering the European Union as the armies that are going to be called around Israel because they don't have any armies anymore. Their armies are gone. The only country in that group that has a significant army is France. But who has the armies? The top 25 armies in the world today are on this list, and eight of them are in the League of Arab Nations. Those are the armies that are gathered around encircling Israel, and I think those are the armies that will be dealt with in the latter days. Turkey and Sudan and Kazakhstan and Ukraine and Iraq and so forth, as I show you here on this map. So I think this is kind of indirect but very supportive evidence of the League of Arab Nations as those toes of iron and clay, miry clay, that are mixed together at the base of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And Joel 3.12 says, For there will I sit to judge and exercise authority over all the heathen round about or surrounding. And the question I ask is surrounding what? And I say surrounding the nation of Israel, God's people and God's land. Okay. So now we're going to move to verses 13 through 17 into our new material. Are there any comments before we do so or any other questions? The only comment I had was a little confusing because the Lord is talking about your know, personal in present tense, but it, it back up in that verse, it says, Oh Lord, like it's Joel speaking again. So I, I'm, not not here. It's the, the first b before this. Okay. The words of verse 11. Yeah, said. verse 11, it says, oh, Lord. Is that supposed to say? Let's see if I can get to that. Uh, I have to go backwards. It, it doesn't matter. I, I don't have it. I don't have it loaded to answer that question. No, no I guess I would say this way. I think we're having a discussion between Joel and the Lord here. And so we're getting two people okay. that are speaking in this chapter. That's, uh, that's what all I needed. That's exactly right. Okay. 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 So now I'm completely out of focus here. Let me get back. I apologize for that. No, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So let's read the King James verses 13 through 17. Put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come. Get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. So put ye in the sickle. What is a sickle and what is it used for? It's a reaper. It's a blade. Okay. It's a curved sword is what it actually is. It's a blade. It's a curved sword. It's the blade of harvest. So when we hear sickle, we're usually talking about something that is ripe, something that has been going on for a while, and now it's about to end because the sickle comes at the end of the harvest. So when we hear about put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe, we're talking about 
Something is about to be collected. Something is about to be gathered. It says, get you down. And this is the word for treading down. This is not a direction or a, 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 a geographical up or down. This is talking about pressing down or pushing down, describing the process of what happens to the grapes in the wine press. So when the wine press occurs, we have these plump, juicy grapes, and then it's time to get down into that wine press and crush them and destroy them as grapes and liberate the fluid. So the press is full. The container for the grapes is full of grapes. And the vats that will be collecting the fluid that comes from the process of treading, those vats will contain the product of the press. And it says that those vats are overflowing. So there's more coming out than they can hold. Okay. Uh, just an, an, an interesting thing. If Have any of you read Amos yet? Gone forward into Amos? In Amos, there's an expression that says, uh, we're going to do it for three, but we're also going to go for four. If you're familiar with that expression, you know, when we measure things, we measure things today in quarters. We take a cup and divide it into four pieces, a quarter cup, a half cup, and a full cup. But in Hebrew, they divide things in third, not in quarters. So three cups is a full cup. Three, can, three, three parts are a full cup. A fourth cup means overflowing. So this word here for overflow literally means the fourth cup. All right. And their wickedness or their malignancy. So this is a term that describes this black fungus that grows on the corn before harvest. It's a malignancy. It's a it, it, it causes harm to others. And so judgment is coming for those who have been a malignancy, those who have gone outside the boundaries of normality and have become a malignancy. Malignancy is not a word we use that much today, but it's very appropriate for many of the practices we see in our world today, that things people are doing things, they are malignancies, they're harming others, Okay. And then it talks about multitudes. Multitudes is a roaring crowd, a crowd that's roaring, a crowd that's rioting. And they're rioting in the valley of decision. Now, a decision is an effort to complete a task. You can't do something until you've decided to do it. So the decision is part of the effort that you're engaged in to complete that task. Okay. And all of these things up to this point are happening in the text because of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is near, and the word near means closer. It's approaching. It's closer in the valley of decision. Now, along with this day of the Lord will come some signs. And those signs are described in verse 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their light withdraw means to diminish and to be diminishing. So this is a verb that tells us that the light is like a dimmer switch. It does. It's not on and off. It's on. And then as time goes forward, it's getting less and less and less as though it's withdrawing and being taken away. And it is. And the light is being taken away. And as the light has been taken away, the darkness has increased. And we see that demonstrated here where the sun and moon shall be darkened and the stars shall diminish their shining. Then, argue. go ahead. Someone had a comment? No. No? Okay. So we see here that during this time of darkening, the Lord will roar out of Zion. What does the word roar mean? Yell loudly. Yell loudly. In this case, even though I don't have it parentheses here for you, it literally means to roar out a command, to roar out an order. Okay? 
and he's going to roar out of Zion and utter his voice or a proclamation from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake. This is a big earthquake. But the Lord will be the shelter or the refuge of his people. So he's going to deliver his collective people. And the strength or the protection of the Ben, the children, the inheritors of Israel. So there's going to be a command. And what is that command? Look at verse 13. There's the command. Harvest. Collect. That's the roar of the Lord. Put in the sickle. Get down. Crush the grapes. The time is now. This is in the latter days. It's time to do the grinding. It's time to do the harvesting. But the people, the inheritors of the promises of God, will be protected by the Lord because he will be their refuge and shelter. So you will know, acknowledge. Everyone at that point will acknowledge. Yeah, those who have been saying it's been God all along will say, see, I told you. And those who have been denying it's been God all along will say, "Uh uh-oh. They will acknowledge, I am Jehovah, the Lord God, who abides in Zion. Now, to dwell or abide, this is an interesting word. I have always thought that abide has meant to stay there. But it means literally in the Hebrew to stay there during opposition or to stay there during resistance. It literally means to stand and defend. Now, that's not what I thought abide meant, but that is what it means in the Hebrew. So when we see here this word, I, the Lord, am your dwelling place. I am abiding in Zion. I am defending Zion. That's what the Lord will do. And when we're told to abide, we are being told to defend the word. And when God abides in us, he is defending us. So I want to enrich your comprehension of what that word abide means. It's much more than simply being in. It's it's being in and remaining despite the fact that someone is trying to take you out. And it's, it's resisting the opposition. Zion is the mountain in Jerusalem, the holy mountain, as God calls it. And then Jerusalem will be set apart. And from this point forward, there will no longer be aliens ever again trotting through her streets, conquering Jerusalem. That will be over in the latter days. So that's what this passage is talking to us about. Any questions? I had an interesting uh, thought in verse 13. I'd like to run it by you. Go ahead. Let's see. Uh, In verse 13, you translated the word, the press is full. If I read it correctly, you said container of grapes. Well, I I think that actually belongs to vats. What I saw as the press is full was it's accomplished. In other words, it doesn't just happen that it's full. It was a plan. And it is accomplished. That, that's what I got out of that word. The press is full. That's the right. press I, I is know. where the grapes go. The vat I, I understand, is where the fluid. No, the no, no. You, you, I don't think you understand. Okay. Because the, 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 the press is containing the grapes and the vats are containing what's left of the grapes after they've gone through their persecution. So the vats are not for the grapes. The vats are for the liquid. For the, okay. the wine that's come from the crushed grapes. See the difference? Okay. Yeah, I do, John. And and okay. in the Good. physical, in the physical, I see that. Okay. But I'm also looking at what I think the word is trying to tell us that in the spiritual, this all doesn't just happen. This is accomplished. Right. Okay. And 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 when it says that it's full, a fullness is it's accomplished. Okay. Full. Okay. Uh, just just a crazy thought, but came to no, me. it's not a crazy thought. In fact, the word overflow is another one that supports your thinking. Yeah, and if something's overflowing, true. obviously it's been done. And the product of the 
the doing is the overflowing. So no, I I, I believe right. you're correct. I just wanted but, to but make you sure see, you it, didn't. Go ahead. You read that and you almost think, well, this is sort of random. It's, it's obviously it's going to happen. No, not obviously. It only happens because it's planned. And we know who planned it. That's okay. that's what strikes my heart. I, okay. I Just me. Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? All right. So Herb has already given us his view of what 13 through 15 means, that it's already in the plan. It's already accomplished. That it's uh, uh, anyone else with any other thoughts on what 13 through 15 means. The day of the Lord has come. And when that day comes in the latter days, when this is describing, the wrath of God will be delivered. And the wrath of God is the divine vengeance upon the people who have disobeyed him. So that's what this is talking about. This is talking about the future latter days when the wrath of God will be delivered on the earth. Look at Romans 12, 19 through 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will reply, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I love this verse because this verse is one of the most misinterpreted verses in all of Scripture. Let's look at it a moment and understand what it's talking about. First of all, what is vengeance? To get even with, that's an eye for an eye. That's a retaliation. Exactly. An eye for an eye. And whose responsibility is that according to this verse? God's. God's, not ours. It's not our responsibility to punish others. It's not our responsibility to seek vengeance. The Lord handles that. What does the Lord want us to do? <laughs> Serve our enemies. Yeah. What is that called? Keeping coals of fire on their heads. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about that. Because, oh, sir, you think that means one thing that it doesn't mean. This passage is telling us to overcome evil. Putting burning coals on a person's head as you're thinking about it is not overcoming evil. It is evil. This does not mean what you think. This is what it means. This means in first century Palestine, when you were out in the cold in the night, right. and you were walking from one place to another, you might die before you got there because it was so cold. So you would take a coal from the fire and you would wrap it in your turban and it would be in your turban where it would keep your head warm. And when you got to your destination, you would take that coal out and it would build a fire for you so that you could survive. Heaping coals of fire on the head is providing for your enemy so they live. It is not taking vengeance on your enemy. That has been mistaught and misconstrued by many, many people for many, many years. And it's stopping right now in this lesson. Heaping coals of fire on his head is a good thing. Because it provides for your enemy and it makes sure they will survive because you're being told to overcome evil with good and do what's right. And now that passage makes sense. Any questions? That's one of those areas where people didn't put the two scriptures together, did they? The one that says, love your enemies, do good to him that mistreats yep. you. Yep. Well, everybody wants to get even. Herb, everybody wants to get ahead. Everybody wants their enemies to suffer. Yep. That's the way of the world. That's what we've been taught. But that's not the way of mercy. I desire mercy, yep. not sacrifice, says the Lord. And we have to understand something. We've been programmed by a worldview that says, if your enemy is your enemy, get them, hurt them, dump the fire on their head. But he doesn't say heap fire on his head. He says coals of fire on his head, which provides for him. It doesn't harm him. It takes care of him. 
an interesting way to look at this passage, and I believe a correct way when you take it in context. Overcome evil. Don't do evil to your enemies. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You feed him. If your enemy's hungry, if he's cold, you make him warm with that coal you've given him for his turban. That's what that says. John, I've heard this interpreted a couple of ways, but one one way, just get your feel and you say yay, yay or nay. It's just our own interpretation. But it says, if you look at it, therefore, if thy enemy is hungry, feed them. If he thirsts, give him a drink. By doing so, thou shalt heat coals of fire on his head. And the way I've heard that interpreted, right or wrong, is that's not hurting that person. That's not vengeance against that person. By putting, it means that person's going to walk now in embarrassment that they were your enemy, but now you've treat, treated them good. And it puts them in an embarrassing situation, a humbling situation they weren't in before as your enemy. And it says your enemy is now going to recognize that you're doing good. Again, that's how I heard it interpreted. I'm not saying that's right. Well, let's expand that even further. Let's expand that to the people observing you and your enemy. And they look at the enemy and they look at what the enemy's doing and they look at you continuing to be humble and continuing to be good. What a witness is that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not only affecting the individual and their enemy. It's it's affecting everyone around. Okay. So again, back to this. The point I'm trying to make here is vengeance is the Lord's. And in chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, he's talking about that vengeance, that wrath is going to come from God. It's not our responsibility to deliver that vengeance. In Joel's future, Nebuchadnezzar will cut down Moab, Abba, Ammon, Egypt, Tyre, Sidon, and the Philistines. Then Cyrus will destroy the Babylonians and Alexander the Great will cut down the Medes and Persians. The divided Greek captains after Alexander will cut down one another, and the Romans will cut them down. What are we seeing here? This is the way of the world. This is the worldview. Get even. Destroy your enemy. And we see each one in turn being destroyed by the next enemy. But God's people are called to a different way. God's people are called to feed their enemies and to give their enemies drink and to provide for them. God's people are called to a different way. In our future, in the Valley of Decision, the League of Arab Nations will cut down the descendants of Rome, Europe, and perhaps America, while the moon and sun are darkened. Now, whether it's the League of Arab Nations or the European Union, God will be in control. There's no armies for the European Union to do that. There will very soon be no armies of America left. Our supplies of weapons are down below 25%. We've given it all to Ukraine. We are disarming every day right now, sending weapons to a war that is just being continued to disarm America. That's happening right now. We, we won't be an army of consequence very soon. So we see these things happening all around us. Okay, what does God do? In verses 16 and 17, he takes control where in Jerusalem. He shakes the heaven and the earth, and he delivers his people. Jehovah will dwell in Zion in Jerusalem, and no foreign invaders will ever enter his gates again, because he's going to defend those gates. All right, let's look at verse 13 again. Put ye in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe. Come and tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. The angels are first of all summoned to reap the ripe corn. And you can read about this in Isaiah 17.5 and Revelation 14.16. After the reaping is done, then they're commanded to tread the winepresses that are filled with the grapes of wrath. Some say this is Armageddon the final battle before Christ comes to reign during the millennium. That this is a picture, this battle that everybody's getting ready for is the battle of Armageddon. Questions or comments? Okay. 
Joel 3, 18 through 21. Let's read it. And it shall come to pass in that day. What day? The last day. The day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Okay. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine. And the hills shall flow with milk. And all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation. And Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent, blameless blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cease, I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So this is the conclusion. Let's put in some Hebrew. The mountain shall drop or drip down fresh, sweet wine, new wine. The hills shall flow with milk. That indicates that there's going to be abundant herds and lots of grain. So the land is going to be restored. The grain is going to grow. The herds are going to feed and they will give abundant milk. So you see a period of time here as well. The rivers or the brooks or gullies of Judah shall flow or be flooded with waters. If you go to the Holy Land now, it's very dry. And many of the streams are empty. And they only have water for a short period of time. But in the future, we shall see all of those streams being filled with water and over flooding with water. Because a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and water the valley of acacias. And acacia is the word for perseverance. For those who have persevered, their thirst will be met. However, the enemies who have been against Israel, who have been against God's people, they shall be a desolation, a wasteland. Edom, Esau, will be a desolate wilderness, an empty wilderness. No crops, no herds, no milk, in contrast to what we see for God's people. For God's enemies, we see exactly the opposite. And it's being delivered unto them. They've attracted the wrath of God. For what reason? Verse 19. Because of the way they've treated the children of Judah. How they have responded to the nation of Israel. Judah shall abide forever. And Jerusalem, from generation to generation, this indicates a continuous fertility. For I will acquit or declare innocent. I will pardon. I will purge. I will free them from guilt, their blood, or their guilt. For the Lord will dwell in Zion. So the day in verse 18 is when the Lord comes. Some people say this is the millennium or after. What is the fountain in verse 18? And there is no one correct answer here. What is the fountain in verse 18? It's a blessing, I think, John. A blessing? Okay. Elaborate, blessing. please. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? I think it's a, the fountain of life. It's yeah. the, the, the life coming from the Lord. It's the fountain. If It's an ever-flowing you know, water every flowing out. Okay. We can use the, the word in verse 20 from generation to generation. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Anyone else? I think a freshness is going to come upon it. A freshness. That okay. revitalization is going to come. Does anyone see Jesus here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anyone see that this fountain that coming forth from the house of the Lord could be Jesus Christ. Well, a lot of commentators reference that and well, say that that is a messianic reference to the coming of the Lord. Some say it's the gospel message. Some say it's grace. Others say it's Jesus Christ. Again, looking at the physical sense and looking at the spiritual sense. That was a living water I was talking about. 
the fountain okay. of the living water. So it's actually, I'm looking at it as, as Jesus Christ, but I'm using a different term. But I, I can see that. Look at what Zechariah 13, 1 says. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Okay. Is it the same fountain referred to here as well? So what contrast do we see between verses 18 and 19? We see two peoples being treated two different ways. We see God's people and we see those who oppressed God's people and the way that the two are being treated. Israel is going to be filled with abundant life. But the lands of her enemies, including Egypt and Edom, shall be desolate, infertile, desert wastelands. They will not continue. What reason is given for the harsh punishment? Verse 19. It's because of their mistreatment of the people of God. And it's interesting here because it says, and Dave, you'll be particularly interested in this. Look at verse 19. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where Israel is today, and Jerusalem is today, in the land that was Judah. So in verse 21, what God accomplishes is in the <sighs> latter days, Jehovah will cleanse, pardon, and free his people from the wages of sin. He's going to cleanse their blood. He's going to cleanse their guilt. What is that called? Forgiveness. Forgiveness? Take it further. Redemption. Redemption. It's called salvation. Salvation, yeah. It's called salvation. That's exactly right. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's salvation. Okay? And how is he going to accomplish that? On the cross. Now, most of you who are on this call, I know. And most of you embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you are saved, says the scripture. But there may be some who are listening or who will listen to this later that doesn't realize this. So I want to address this. This will be review for some of you. It'll be maybe new for one. And it's that one that I'm targeting. Jesus Christ's blood cleanses us from sin and unrighteousness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at Joel 3. Verse 21, for I will cleanse, I will save. That's what this passage is saying. This cleansing process, being freed from the consequences of our sin, is called salvation. Salvation is to be delivered from the consequences of sin. Now, all of you have been put here for a reason. Who needs salvation? There is no one righteous, no, not one. Everyone needs salvation. So when you come upon a lost person, when you, Bruce, when you, Charlie, when you, Angela, when you, Herb, come upon a lost person, do you know the scriptures that you can use to lead them to Christ? Most of you probably do. But if you don't, you will now. The first thing is we've all sinned. There is no difference. All men are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. They can't get there by themselves. That's Romans 3.23. The wages of sin, because of that sin, they will die. 
they will be eternally separated from God. But God provides a gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 23. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came as the Savior. That's John 3, 16 through 17. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, before we did any good deed, while we were still wretched, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was his act on the cross that paid the price for our sin. No action that we've taken. Romans 5, verse 8. It begins with the cross where my Savior died. That's the key. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So Christ shed his blood on the cross and died for us. For by grace ye are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of your works, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. The kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not about us. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send to you another. The Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 4 through 6. For grace you were saved through faith. It is the gift of God. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We're saved by the Lord Jesus. If he's not the Lord, he can't save us. If Jesus isn't God, he has no authority or power to save us. But Jesus is God. He is the Lord. And what does Lord mean? Lord means owner. Lord means the one who paid the price. It means Jesus Christ who died on that cross for your sin. He is the Lord Jesus. And when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that he lives, he's been raised, he's been resurrected, you are saved. That's salvation. That's the cleansing process. It begins with the cross, but it finishes with the empty tomb and the risen Christ. We see that in all of these minor prophets. We see that 333 times in the Old Testament about Jesus Christ and who he is. It's not about what you do or what you will do about your deeds or your works. Whatever you try, you'll always fall short. It's called sin. You need someone to help you. Salvation is about the work that Christ did. What he accomplished fully, completely on the cross. It's about Christ dying, but not staying dead. And rising up to leave that tomb empty as a testimony that he lives. And what is your part? Confess Jesus is your Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's it. No works, nothing that you have to do except trusting in the Lord and he will cleanse you. It begins with the cross. It ends with the empty tomb. To whom is this invitation of salvation extended to? And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, shall be saved. Joel 2, 32. So, those of you who hear my voice, 
those of you who see these scriptures, if you have a decision to be made, make it. You don't want to be a sinner in the hands of an angry God. You want to be a child in the bosom of your father of grace and mercy. So if you have not made your decision to accept the gift that God offers you, the time is now. Make that decision. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for these scriptures. We thank you for this truth. We thank you for knowing what you did on the cross. And we thank you for the proclamation of the empty tomb. He lives. He lives. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for creating us, for giving us your Bible, for giving us your word, for giving us your spirit, for giving us this time to reflect upon ourselves and what we've done without you and how much we need you. Thank you, Lord, for being our deliverer. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. This is what we believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, be cleansed, be delivered. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Does anyone have any questions? I heard an interesting comment from one of our commentators that struck me that I just pass along to you because you talk about how we respond to you know unbelievers or unsaved world or whatever. And it's natural human tendency to judge them and judge their sin without really knowing them. And to put it in perspective, is the only person you really can judge of sin is yourself. Because you're the only one that knows your sin, and no one else knows it besides you and God. And for you to judge someone else's sin not knowing them, it, it makes no sense. It puts this whole how we look at unbelievers, how we look at even believers that sin, don't judge their sin because look at yourself and what you've done in your life and where you've sinned. And you've got more sin in your life than you could ever ask to be taken away. So it just puts a different perspective on that when you look at it that way, that the only person you really know their sinful nature is yourself. You don't know anybody else's sinful nature. Okay, I want to be careful with the words here, though, David. When you use the word judge, I, I think you're saying condemn. We are not to condemn anyone, but to judge, to make a decision about the path they're on and to make a decision about their need for a savior. I think we are called to do exactly that. And we are called to present the gospel to them because we do not know whether they are saved or not. And I think we are not to condemn anyone. That is the Lord's to do, not ours to do. But we are, I believe, always to present the gospel and present our witness so that that person has that exposure to the truth. Herb, go ahead. Yeah, I, I uh, judge for yourselves. I wrote to uh, President Biden and... Uh, First, I was very polite, I want you to know. I told him I pray for him every day, he and the entire administration, and I do. Uh, but I also reminded him that he and I are both octogenarians, and that probably sooner rather than later, he and I would stand before the judgment seat of God. And I asked him to consider his thoughts on abortion 
in particular. And I said, I wouldn't want to stand in front of God having supported abortion, no matter what title you put on. And that's all I said. Now, is that judging him, David? I, I don't. What I, do you think? I don't know. Uh, I think John's point about judge, judging is accurate because it says, judge not that thou, thou shalt be judged. Yeah. But it also says, take this, don't judge the speck that's in your brother's eye until you take the log out of your own eye. Yeah, well. So, yeah. So, which means you are to judge that speck, but yeah, you only after, after you, you have judged it. your own. Yeah. When will a speck come out of my own eye? I, said, I keep asking that question, and I've pretty well determined the Lord's going to have to come back and remove it. <laughs> but again, I think it's in, in the words, Dave and Herb. I think if, if we if we recognize it is not ours to condemn others, it is not ours to pass final judgment on others as far as their eternal destination. That's not for us to do. But I think it is for us to recognize that there is no one righteous, no, not one. That's a judgment, my friend. And that's judging everyone as not righteous. Therefore, it behooves us the responsibility to present to them that God loved the world that he gave his son, and that son is available for you if you want it. Because we know there isn't no one righteous. That judgment, that determination is scriptural. That's not opinion. Does, yeah. does my motivation have any bearing on what I wrote to him? Because there are two reasons I wrote to him the way I wrote. The first was change your policy on abortion. I want that change. That's me. The second is that, is there a large penalty to pay for ignoring God and his commands? As, and, and, and the truth is, I don't want him to suffer eternally, you know? And, and so I had a dual motivation. I One is self-serving. Did you tell him that in your letter? I just Did simply you... said that we were both going to face a uh, God and that we were going to have to answer for what we espouse right. on this earth and do on this earth. That's all I said. I okay. didn't say it was right, wrong, or indifferent. Okay. I just said, just think about what you're doing. And that's where I left it. So I left okay. it up to him to be the judge, actually, of his own, of, of his own uh, doing. What, what, I, what I would suggest in, in future such things that what you consider is offering them the love of Christ, that Jesus loves you and died for you on the cross. And the path that you're taking is not consistent with that gift. And I just want you to know that he's waiting and calling you and offer he's him the love of that God. By saying him, he's a Christian, he's already espoused that. I don't have to remind you. I, I guess I could remind okay. you. You're right. That's fine. Good remind. Yeah. Right. Any yeah. anyone else with other comments or no, questions? No, I, I agree with where you are, so I don't disagree with that. And maybe using judge others of their sin, I don't mean that that we're not to correct a brother that we see sinning because scripture is clear. We are. We are to bring that in front of somebody. We are to do that. So I'm not saying that. And I, maybe you misunderstood me. It's what I'm saying is I don't want to compare someone else's sin to my sin. And think I sin less oh, than someone okay. else, and so that yeah. was my comparison. Not that we don't judge people at all. So sin, sin is point it yeah. out. Sin is sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else with any other questions about salvation? All right. We're out of time, so we need to close here. So let me close this in prayer, and then I'll stay behind in case anybody has any other questions. If you have questions about what I've presented at the end, I very much want to talk to you about that. So you can write me at jdribbis at hotmail.com, and I will respond to you directly. Uh, dear Lord and Father, thank you for this lesson today. Thank you for the teaching of your word. Thank you for the presence of your spirit. Thank you for the assurance provided to us by the actions of your son, who did everything that needs to be done for us to be saved. And it's for us now to accept that and to trust and have faith in him. We thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank you for these others who are seeking to know your word, that you will fulfill them, Lord, and help them to realize how much you love them, that they would uh, 
those who do not know you would make that decision today and come to you as Lord and Savior. In your holy and precious name, we pray. Amen.